back, back while you run. Run, 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 jump and stop. Put me down. When it was first revealed, not long after Disney bought out Lucasfilm, that they would be making Star Wars spin-offs to coincide with their main saga films, reactions were decidedly mixed. On one hand, this could be seen as a chance to delve even deeper into the Star Wars universe without having to worry about whatever is going on in the main story. On the other hand, they would essentially be making more Star Wars prequels. Gee, I wonder why anyone would be the least bit concerned. But hey, they proved themselves last year with The Force Awakens. Who's to say they couldn't do it again with Rogue One? The first of these self-proclaimed anthology films takes place roughly not too long before the events of A New Hope, where the Rebellion is nearing towards the edge of defeat in their ongoing fight against the Empire, especially after hearing the news of the most recent construction of a mysterious superweapon capable of destroying an entire planet that most refer to as a Death Star. One of the film's main protagonists, Jin Erso, played by Felicity Jones, is called in by the Rebel Alliance to help find a way to destroy the soon-to-be-fully-armed-and-operational battle station, due to the fact that her father, played by Mads Mikkelsen, is the man responsible for creating it. Joining her on this perilous mission is a small ragtag group of capable fighters, including a very conflicted Rebel Alliance captain, played by Diego Luna, a defected Imperial pilot, played by Riz Ahmed, a blind Jedi Temple guardian and his trusted laser cannon toting sidekick, played by Donnie Yen and Zhang Wen respectively, and the film's only source for comic relief, a reprogrammed Imperial droid with a sassy attitude named K2SO, played by Alan Tudyk in a motion capture performance. The movie was directed by Gareth Edwards, who here applies the same sense of dread and scale featured from his last big budget outing, Godzilla. Every time we see an Imperial ship hover above a city in the desert, or pass along by the Death Star itself, you really feel the size and weight of these battle stations on display. Display, and the visuals blend in seamlessly with their surrounding environments. It's also the darkest entry in the series since Empire Strikes Back, which probably has been cited more times than one could say who Luke Skywalker's father is, but it really bears repeating. The way they depict the Rebellion's 11th hour struggle is akin to something you probably see in a gritty war film, with main characters making desperate decisions, even to the point where they have to kill their own for the greater good. The greater good. In fact, I was a little taken aback that both this series and Disney would even consider signing off on such bleak narrative decisions. I guess it just goes to show that the House of Mouse truly is a force to be reckoned with. And of course, you can't make a gritty war film without having some incredible action set pieces, the best of which are featured prominently in the film's climax, and yeah, it truly is epic as f Oh, and the way they tie up loose ends that lead directly into A New Hope, that's just the icing on the cake. But despite the many, many things I thought were absolutely great in this, there were a few nagging flaws that kept it from being just as good or even better than something like The Force Awakens. The main issues I had were mostly with the slow pacing of the film's first half, which might have had something to do with the reported reshoots that they had to go through, but I could be wrong, so feel free to correct me on that. I also thought that most of the characters, while still likable, could have been developed a little better with more distinctive personalities, instead of acting as one character divided into multiple parts. Parts, which is a shame considering this is one of the most diverse cast ensembles to be introduced in this series thus far, and you'd think they would have worked a little harder on helping the audience find an emotional connection with every single one of them. However, the ones who I thought received the worst treatment were Mads Mikkelsen and Forrest Whitaker, both terrific actors whose character backstories are set up so well that you can't help but feel disappointed by how short their parts were or how poorly their performances came across. And then you have 
have the film's CGI cameo appearances of deceased famous actors. At first, it's highly impressive how close we are to making these actors look the way they did back in 1977 using the latest in technology, but the longer they stay on screen, the more the illusion starts to become a distraction. And given the recent news of Carrie Fisher's passing, I really hope they don't rely on this technology to help finish her character's story arc in her last remaining films. I'd rather have my last memory of General Leia be of the real General Leia, not Paul Walker's CGI double. But even with all those minor setbacks, I still thought this was another great addition to the Star Wars franchise, one that could definitely be seen as a permanent replacement of the dreaded prequel trilogy, with plenty of fun easter eggs, gorgeous scenery, and incredible action to go around to satisfy both diehard fans and casual moviegoers alike. Hell, they even went out their way to make my boy Darth Vader an intimidating badass, something that most of us thought we'd never see again. And that, my friends, is what leads me to giving Rogue One an 8.5 out of 10. And that concludes our last show of 2016. Sorry it only came down to only two this year, but more will most definitely come in 2017. I will make sure of it. Until then, feel free to subscribe, leave a friendly comment down below, tell us what you thought about Rogue One. And as always, I'm the host, and may the Force be with you all.